It's a pleasure to be here with you. Oh, thanks. Yeah. yeah. And it's good uh, to meet you. You are from Blogwatch yeah. and blogger, social media users. So we are we will be broadcasting to Twitter and also Facebook. And mm -hmm. after this, it will be come up on. Uh, usually, when we talk to candidates, we normally ask about their platform. And then I, uh, we're reading your, we have this uh, website, Know Your Candidate, and your profile is there, mm -hmm. and including the platform. Mm -hmm. And I noticed one of your main platforms is Public Safety. Yes, it's Which my main platform. Yes, actually. it's your main. Yes. And it's, it's, it's very timely considering what happened at the Boston Marathon. Yes. Yeah. And I noticed uh, you have four possible legislation. I think one, two, three, four. Public Safety Reorganization Reform Act. Okay. Yeah, you have the National Crime Surveillance and Protection Act, Disaster Risk Reduction and Environment Environmental Management Act, and the Barangay Insurance for Development Oh, all that public? I don't have. Mm -hmm. No, I don't have the Barangay Insurance. Mm -hmm. no, yeah, that that's not mine. Are that yours? No. <laughs> no, actually, can you repeat that? Yes, yeah. I, I, we just saw this at the website, so I, I just want to yeah. confirm. Public Safety Reorganization and Reform Act. Actually, yours? none of them is there. None of them is mine. Proposed legislation on public safety. Yes. 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 This is proposed, but um, what would be your? Because public safety is very wide. Yes. We can talk about cyber uh, crime. Uh -huh. uh, yes, and we can talk also of health concerns. So, which safety uh, are you looking at? Well, I'm actually looking at primarily on how a mother wants to keep her children safe. Yeah. Well, I'm a well, I'm a mother who's running for the Senate that emphasizes that um, because of motherhood, primarily, we must keep our children safe and our mother country. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, for me, can see public safety is prevention. But um, when you speak about um, if you if you don't give ample prevention. Then you speak about re about response, and after you respond, you speak about post crisis. Yeah. Yeah. So those three, I think, are very important. Yeah. yeah. Without without public safety, or to put it simpler, without keeping safety for the public, yeah. there's no way that we can get anyone to set up any business. And I think that's. That's primarily like really sad because mm -hmm. we have three million that are jobless. So, so what do I mean? It's like if I were to set up a business um, anywhere, I'd like my employees and myself to feel safe, and I don't want any changes midstream on any policies that may affect my business when I am going on an international capability and I must be accountable to my investors who are abroad or in, in any other country. So it's part of keeping the economy safe so that we don't lose the investors. And when we have um, people that have jobs, then um, we are not going to have criminality. It may lessen. But why do we have criminality? Because basically everybody's looking for a job and doesn't have a job, so they're just wandering around, you know, doing nothing. And because we have criminality, how do you stop criminality? I think it's, it's law enforcement. And that law enforcement means uh, visibility. And we can't have visibility because we don't have enough police cars. We can't even prevent enough fires because we don't have the, the clothing that firemen need for their protection. And we don't even have the law in our side when there are women that are in jail for 10 years and have served their punishment five years ago. And I think these are concerns that women should take a good look at. And even as simple as closing the stove and if you cook using firewood, then I think every woman should be aware that she can burn her own house and her neighbor's house. But there's some specific legislation you will want to file? I would like to file a legislation on Which one? how safe our, sh uh, our ships, okay, the ships. Our, our airplanes are, uh -huh. 
and our trains are traveled, how safe are they? And the legislation that they want in order to, to stop criminality and, and, and give encouragement to young and old people, you know, mm -hmm. is, is like if every barangay captain was given an increased budget of one million to implement the project that they want to, then um, from that implementation of their projects, then they can hire those in the barangay. So it's a direct hiring in the lowest unit of our um, government, which is the barangay. Mm -hmm. So you're saying, I, I can't give two million or three million or one million jobs on my own. Mm -hmm. But if, if I can legislate that, the direction of the barangay, the, um, the jobless will have jobs. Mm -hmm. And I think for the safety of the women, uh, like the rural health workers, yeah. they um, are given an honorarium of 500 to 700 pesos a month but they take care of everybody, including their own. So if they were made to be uh, government employees, mm -hmm. this would be really encouraging for the women to, you know, that they have something to hold on to when they retire for, the, for themselves after dedicating their lives to others. In disaster preparedness, um, you, think, you think it needs to be strengthened? Um, I think certain so. Legislation? I which, think which so. Specific because earthquake? Um, I, I, I think that many laws are not implemented. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's, it's a precaution that the local government should do. When when there is a typhoon signal and um, there are residents that are living by the river mm -hmm. or the streams, automatically um, the National Disaster Council of every province mm -hmm. should have everything ready for evacuation. But but this is done like, like I, at least in a six months or one year preparation, it's like if and when I was governor actually, knowing that the typhoon season as it was like June, July, August, September, we're, we already are ready. Like can we afford to buy a water, a water raft? Can we, can we use the schools as evacuation sites? Do we have enough rice that we can feed the um, evacuees? Uh, how will the the children that go to school uh, respond to no classes because mm -hmm. many are uh, using their classrooms as homes? I know. Yeah, this is, this is it's really a, a brief preparation for the um, the weather that mm -hmm. we encounter. You know, even in schools, I, I know some children do not feel safe because of bullying. Yeah. Uh, how uh, have you also put a uh, check the school I think there's a law. Yeah, I, I think they... Yeah, but I, it's I, not I really... In the I still get complaints. So I don't know how else I can help <laughs> here. How you can help. Yeah, yeah. because well, uh, it's not... Um, when I refer them to Dep Ed, I don't know what else can we do. Yeah, they say that it's no. the, it's the um, fraternities, right? That, that they blame. Yeah, also yeah. fraternities. Even the young children. They're just yeah. bullied by their fellow classmates. Yeah, that's true. But you know, sometimes I also think it's part of growing up and protecting yourself, mm -hmm. learning how to manage. Because the world is not all this kind. You know, so when you're a little boy and, and oh, I, I, my, my, my grandchild has gone through that, you know, people bullying him, you know, pushing him down the stairs with his school, school bags. So what, what we do is, what we've done is to complain to the school authorities. Mm -hmm. that we don't need children like that in school. Okay. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, aside from... There was even a Korean once who, oh who, yeah. who, who bullied my, my grandson in, in the bus oh and yeah. pulled his hair. You know, I think foreign nationalities should also be taught, their parents should be taught that if they want to be integrated into the Filipino system, that Filipinos aren't mean. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're really rather gentle. But the, but but what what Mikey did was to complain to the school authorities, and they did act on it and expelled the boy. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. very strict yeah. actually. And I think it should be like that. Yeah, I know. How about the corporal punishment? Um, are you for for the passing of the bill? I'm not sure if it's already passed in the Senate. I think it was passed in Congress. It's um to avoid punishment with. Uh, Discipline. 
Yeah, everybody should be disciplined if they want to learn how to, you know, live live in a in, in a country that that shares, you know, an inch of his own home, you know, yes. into in, into his neighbor. Yeah, there should be a punishment for that. I really believe so. You yeah, know, but children. For children, oh, I think that the punishment should only be for children that are about 15 years old, mm-hmm. yeah. but not but not um, below 15, because these kids, I mean, I mean, they can just be like naughty children, mm-hmm. but but if they engage in something that's like a heinous crime, oh, then okay, you're talking about the crime. Yeah. yeah, then they mm-hmm. should really be put, put in, not not just in a reform home, but really in jail. Yeah, uh, you believe it's 15 years old. I think so. Yeah, I think there is a plan to lower it. Yeah, to lower it to 12. Yes. But then mm-hmm. kids of 12 don't really know much you know, about whether they did anything really wrong. It could have been a temper. Mm-hmm. It could have been that they see on TV, you know, a lot of guns on TV and, and, and how killers can get away with it. <laughs> yeah, Sonny, would you like to follow up with cyber? What will be your advocacy month? <coughs> what will be your program in case you will be in a seat? Pagdating sa area na my advocacy is online safety and uh, mm-hmm. yeah. based on my exposure to schools, uh, parents do not pay attention to the online risks. I mean, they try to delegate this to the school. When I talk to the guidance uh, office and they are telling us na these are non-curriculum issues so it's better left to the parents and I'm talking about these top tier schools that unless uh, the guidance office would uh, initiate a program for the kids then uh, the online safety aspect the online ethics aspect will not be taught and uh, at least in my opinion it should be started around uh, grade one mm-hmm. where the GMRC is already integrated to the, the curriculum uh, for the kids. Now, what would you be supporting programs or do you have some bills on mind that could enhance the online intelligence of uh, the parents and uh, equip the school as well to cope with the online risks, the grooming, the luring, the cyberbullying? Yeah, actually, that the, um, we are taught by the U.S. Embassy and the PBSC on, on cybercrime. But but then this is not for children. No? But I just mm-hmm. say this as as, as uh, officers, no, mm-hmm. who are majors and lieutenant colonels and and, 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 and colonels. The the cyber crime is actually used to detect um, crimes against the state, mm-hmm. and and these crimes against the state are are are, are really very dangerous because they include transnational crimes, mm-hmm. yeah? right? So. Um, We've been taught by the U.S. Embassy that that if there is an offense regarding the cyber crime, that that these computers are actually um, must be safeguarded because there are national security risks if anybody gets hold of the computers, right? Mm-hmm. Because it can be dissected. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and there's also that law that says that the that the ju- Department of Justice can actually um, have a hold order on all the computers, right? Mm-hmm. And then and then have someone analyze it, mm-hmm. right? That's where the danger lies too. Six. Yeah, yeah. But on the little kids of about one year old, I think they should be taught. <coughs> maybe, maybe not one year old, honey, I think that's too young. Beginning grade one, not? A ah, grade one, Beginning yeah, grade a grade one, one mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, I'm not so sure whether I want to start them on a grade one level. Maybe a little bit like grade three, I think, maybe. Because yeah. even before they would learn how to read, they knew already yeah. how to operate an iPad. Oh, they do. Yeah, yeah, my grandchildren know how to do that. Yeah. So at least yeah. more on the ethics aspect of using that, especially protection of the privacy of the family. Yeah. It's Actually, more on, I hope, at, at, at right now, based on my observation, none is paying serious attention unless there is a major issue. Yeah. There is no major yeah, issue, there right, is no you know? discussion. Yeah, yeah. But on a day-to-day level, um, the school is not paying much attention to it. The parent association of the, the school are not yeah. also into it. And uh, so the kids are left alone mm-hmm. to understand and explore the digital environment without the proper mm-hmm. guidance of uh, either the teachers or, or the parents. I think I think I say only the seniors old because 
I don't spoil my grandchildren. I don't let their parents buy them a mm -hmm. a, a computer at one year old. No, mm -hmm. I have my my the, my grandson of uh, three years old knows how to handle the computer, and my my grandson of ten knows how to handle it. But he certainly doesn't have any of those pornographic stuff in that. Mm -hmm. That uh, they're allowed to 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 look at. You but know? at least not in one school. This is again an international school, and then grade one students mm -hmm. they are passing around the porn URL mm -hmm. among friends, and they were able to get that through the computer of the father, one of the father. Of the yes. So when the guidance office was able to discover it, yes. so they called the parents, and the father just said. Um, eventually, they will learn that. So, why should they prevent them from exploring? Oh, no, yeah. no, I'm not for that. The so parents should really mm -hmm. guide their children on what they, what they should watch and what they, they can play on the computer. Yeah. Actually, I always blame the parents when, when the children don't turn out you know, yep. to learn what. Yeah. This so, is would you be willing to support um, interventions, whether in the form of a program or form of a bill, a law, that mm -hmm. will compel making sure? that uh, yeah. there will be collaboration between uh, the, the academy, parents and the school, the parents yes. and even yes. the local government I think so. to make yeah. sure that uh, yeah. online safety, the safeguards are there. Yeah. I actually that even brings me to another topic. It's like, it's like um, yes, I agree that the parents should be castigated. I also agree that um, if I have like, like a drug addict child, that it's the it's the pusher that should be punished, and if there's anybody that has that's a pimp, don't 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 blame the prostitutes, but blame the pimp, mm -hmm. and they should be punished. Equally yeah. liable, yeah. Of course, yeah. Because all of them are victims, actually, mm -hmm. of somebody who's smarter. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And I don't think that children below three years old should be actually own their own computer. But uh, at least that's your mindset, mom, because yeah. uh, I have a friend who is into selling uh, edu toys. Mm -hmm. According to him, once upon a time, a three-year-old girl would request for a doll yeah. as a present. But right now, they are requesting for an iPad or an iPhone. Yeah, no more. There's no more robots. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, things are changing. Yeah. So yeah. I think the, uh, the decision makers should also adapt to the changes to make sure the safeguards are there. Yeah, but actually, I even think that the, that the manufacturers should also, you know, the limit. Like, if there was such a law that said these are these are the only programs that that the children of one mm -hmm. one to seven can watch. And, and actually, it's and then if we could, if you could um, propose, man, that to have a sort of parent MPRCP. Counterpart right. for, yeah. for the for the kids, yes, yes. Yeah, for the digital for the different yeah. games, for yeah. the different para. This body will be the certifying body. Uh, yeah. Okay, this kind of game is good for this one age to seven age. or yeah. seven to forty. Yes, we don't have this. Definitely, we, we don't have it here yet. Yeah, that I really support. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you brought that up. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. In connection with that, uh, Abu Netizens filed the bill. Uh, no, through Senator Miriam from Chavez, the Magna Carta for the Philippine Internet. Too, uh, and we're hoping that we could also help support that because uh, mm -hmm. you, you said something earlier on the, the national security risk you know, yes. about cybercrime. So um, this is one of the issues that netizens really want to push in the mm -hmm. Senate. Uh, if you could uh, look into it, um, it protects the civil and public rights of Filipinos. Uh, basically, our the f freedom of the use of the internet. Mm -mm. Uh, mm -hmm. Have you read the latest cybercrime law? Um, I read the cybercrime law, but I don't know what the latest. I read it last year. Is there another one? I mean, the, the one yeah. that was the it was there was a TRO. Did you read that? The a three year old, and then mm -hmm. it was. Uh, we're expecting that it will be there will be something that will be out. In mm -hmm. the next but not in the days. law. Not Maybe still just as an uh, incident. Yeah. yeah. But then um, we believe that there, uh, that it's not really the, it's, it, it doesn't really address the crimes in the internet. Ah, uh, you want it to be stronger. 
um, to go, I mean, for, and also protect our rights. That's why we have this Magna Carta for Philippine Ah, so the rights versus the, pa the, yeah. the punishment. Yeah, yeah that's okay. true. It's, it's not, it's not yeah. proportionate and uh, uh, it's, it, it is um, impinging already on our rights. That's uh, why we would like you to look at it, the yes, I will. Magna Carta for Philippine. And it, this one is, is better, I think, because um, these are netizens uh, crowdsourcing it. Yeah. And um, it will be, of course, to file in the next call. Okay. So it, it, it's really the, the responsibility you know, that's attached to, yes, the to, to all of these new experiences. Yeah. And the rights. Yeah. So even if uh, you, you, you say you're not an active internet user, <laughs> I'm yeah. sure your children are. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, Rosh, you want to add? Um, I have another question. Um, it's, uh, um, I'm not surprised that your uh, main platform is about public safety. But my question is, um, when you were still young, I wondered why you took up National Security Administration as your course. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, it is a one-year course, and I took it up because I had a professor in USD who wanted me to learn about national security because I had done my my master's degree with a minor in theology in in Mindanao because the the, the USP priest wanted me to really give a contribution to history. Okay. And um, the contribution I did came from this one paragraph from from Saladin, uh, the Lebanese author on the history of Sulu. And it said that that the Muslims were the bravest people that he had known about okay. because when they were attacked in 1848 by the Spaniards mm -hmm. in the island of Tonkil, in the smaller island of Balangi, they had four forts because they were into slave trading mm -hmm. and slave raiding. They caught the Christians on the seashores. Okay. Yeah. So as revenge, the Spaniards had to stop this because they couldn't control the the um, the thievery of human beings and who were sold to the Spaniards, the French, and the Chinese, and the um, and the English, because they needed people to man their ships okay. and and to dive, looking for tripang and seaweed and 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 manpower. So the Spaniards attacked this island, and all of them, you know, they attacked the forts and they used the longest ladders that had ever been used mm -hmm. in the history of 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 the Philippines in any attacks. And the women and children dove to their deaths. They those those that were not killed by the Spaniards just jumped over the uh, hundreds of high fort, you know, made of limestone. And so it really intrigued me. So so that's why I, I said I'm gonna take off from my Philippine history and look for this tribe, which I did. So looking at that story about the tribe really was a part of national security. That that should have been practiced in the eighteen forty eight, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So na national security, yes, because there was participants, the boats, fast swift boats used by this Samal, and it, there was the weather that went Amihan and Habagat. So I had covered the environment, I had covered the transportation and how they they they, they did that. Their 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 modus was was a surprise attack with throwing nets over the over the Christians in the seashores of like Bohol, Masbate, Bicol and then gathering them and then putting them in their ships and long off they went. So obviously there was no protection for them. Yeah. Or news did not go as fast as internet today. Yeah. So I said, Oh, this is national security. So when I was um, offered a slot in the National Defense Council of the Philippines, I I said yes. Yeah. Mm. It, it it kind of tied up with the Muslim culture that I really wanted to be my my expertise and for 30 years, I've been studying Muslim culture. Yeah. Why? Because it's really a contribution to the Philippines. Um, when, when when you know about the Moro, uh, our Moro brothers, mm -hmm. it's um, it's extremely challenging to know that actually Hadramaut had begun in in Yemen, mm -hmm. how they came here into into Indonesia, into Malaysia, to the Philippines. It's really a very challenging history. Yeah, and uh, how they were able to conquer Spain, and then end up here the Philippines, the royalty, like the Bongsan in 1414 in Maguindanao, and then Abu Bakar in 1298 in Sulu, mm -hmm. 
it, it's really absolutely interesting. And I, if it wasn't that I was campaigning, I was on to Islamic studies at UP. Yeah. And the uh, influence of um, uh, Islam in Southeast Asia. Yeah. <coughs> but you're a Catholic. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So is that the reason Mom, why your name is being grabbed on the Sabah issue? Because of your heart for yes. the moral cause? Yes. But actually, um, I didn't know about the invasion, but I can't say that I don't know well. the Kirams as well as, as I know the Tans and the Loons and Amins and, and Tulawi and, uh, and um, Arbisons and I know them all. So, yeah, I did. But I'm, I, I'm trying to internalize this and thinking, um, if they were on to an invasion, why would they only be 243 uh, Tausug who went there? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And why did they only have like 27 Armalites and 23 hand guns if they were willing to invade North Borneo and Saba, which in their thinking is theirs? Mm -hmm. So it's like if I decide to go in the high seas, any fishing boat will have, will have ammunition because it's dangerous in the high seas. There's piracy, you know, until today. And uh, so were they really mistaken, you know, as not an invading force, but, uh, but as a body of thousands of people who wanted to live there together with their relatives? What is your reading? Because you know them so well. Were they, re they just were there for to I clean don't, their land? I don't, you know, these thousands are very intelligent. You know, and, and, and they go force force against force and and they'll commit suicide if they have to, you know, they'll just they'll you know, but most certainly like like any invading force, you know, against the Royal North Borneo Army, two hundred and forty three suicide. <laughs> mm -hmm. And and when you consider that that the Royal Army Army of Sabah has like Firepower and sea power, land power, the the infantry. You know, there's no way that they would live. 243 of them would get killed the minute that they step there. If they're if they're um, wanting to go there, it was meant to be an invasion. I doubt it. You know, like Turtle Island, Cagayan de Sulu, Sitangkai, they all go to buy canned foods in Saba. Mm. That's where they get their vegetables, their 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 spam, their sardines, their rice. They get it from there. It's like shopping. Mm. And for them, the gateway to the Philippines is really Tawi Tawi. That's their frame of mind. The radio is even a bahasa. Their money is ringgit. For us, because we're Christians, we think it's great grand Manila. Mm -hmm. For them, it's great grand Tawi Tawi. <laughs> So what's the solution for you? I think the solution was never to threaten. Because the more you threaten, the more that they will be um, not angry, but um, riled up, you know, to want to, to want to prove that Saba is there. Yeah. And the solution is always peace. Mm -hmm. yeah. You can't learn, you know, 30 years of studies in one day. You know, that's why when, when the administration was threatening, you don't, you don't threaten anybody. No way. And besides, how can you threaten anybody who believes that this land is his? You know? So, when you speak about it, it's like they needed compassion and understanding. Because many are jobless there, many have relatives there, some may have papers, some may not have papers to remain there, but they find that they'd rather stay in the Philipp uh, in Sabah with work than in the Philippines with no work. So you have the Iranos there, you have the Yakan, you have the Tausu, who go by boat and they live there with the relatives, they even <coughs> with them. And then they go back after a week, back to Tawi Tawi, mm -hmm. and they're so happy because they saw their relatives. We can't, ha we can't support them economically. So why not go and stay there and trade there? Even if it's under the administration of the um, Malaysians, then they can get their papers ready, and some had papers that were ready, and they didn't have to. They didn't have to be sent back to the Philippines if they had papers. 
So I think the solution is that that the government should stress now, if they really want peace in Mindanao, then they should stress the sovereignty. That that they should face it. You know, why should they be afraid of it? That Malaysia, um, the part of uh, North Borneo and Sabah, was a present to the Sultan Bakhtiar of Sulu in 1685. So it's good. You know, let's let's start to get peace for every group, diba? Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, if you really want peace in Mindanao. But then the MILF can continue and the government on the peace process because Sabah is not part of the equation, you know, or part of arms. So it should just continue. But do you think the MILF peace deal or the <laughs> government negotiation <laughs> would address the Mindanao, at least the peace and order problem in Mindanao, considering the MNLF is not happy with, with what is going on. No, no, because because um, the, the MNLF believes that they're claiming the same ancestral domain. Yeah, that's a problem. You know, because they're both claiming the same areas. But um, the Islamic, uh, the Organization of Islamic Conference was present in the signing of the MILF. And the only true representative of that Islamic organization is Miswari. So the fact that they recognize Miswari as the only representative, and yet they were in the MILF sends, sends me a different signal. You know, that, that maybe they no longer support Miswari, maybe. And I, I, I don't know, but so why would they be in the signing of the peace agreement? But I think it's going to take long, Sunny, because, because the, the, the organic act is, is going to be completely debunked which was never even implemented. So now, now they're, go- they're going to come up with, with new new laws mm-hmm. regarding on how um, the MILF should govern, ARMM. That's going to take two years, and everybody's going to be so restless in wanting to, you know, to want in, in, in wanting to um, develop the ministerial form of government. So assuming that uh, this agreement will be reached. So it will supersede the agreement with the MNLF. It looks like that, yeah. So if everybody was taken in, in the very beginning of the negotiations, then at least you could settle the MN, the MI, But do you think the everybody Kiram? was brought in? No. no. So the, the problem is far from over. Yes. <laughs> Although I'm very close to the MI. In 1985, when we were campaigning for Cory, actually, and we were organizing because um, we were under still Marcos, no? Mm-hmm. Um, we went to see the MI in Camp Abu Bakar, and they said to us, we were never for secession. We just wanted to be recognized. He said, because we go by the Islamic religion. And also, um, we want to have some an arrangement with the, with the government on how we can have our land back. It was, it's still the same. They haven't changed the stand. It's still their ancestral domain. Yeah. And also, if you're going to get at Naomi, several municipalities from North Cotabato and include them, and you're going to get six from from um, Lano Norte, you've got to have a plebiscit because you just can't say, I want the following municipalities under. No? So I'm really close to the MI. In fact, I'm Milang of the child. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But and do you think, Mom, it is one step closer? The MI and a peace deal is one step to address a problem, or is it going to rock the boat further? No, I think it's all right. Yes, I think it's one step all right. Yeah. Yeah. Because, they're, because these leaders of today are tempered. If you wait for the leaders that are going to come up, when we are all dead, <laughs> these these other leaders are more restless and they're more revolutionary. Yeah. It's better to talk with the yeah, more the, mature the, the ones. Seasons, than the far, yeah, fighters. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, Miss Kuhanko, um, I'm interested because I'm reading books regarding the EDSA people power revolution, and I've um I've read the Senate President's memoir saying that um, 
you were one of the people who supposedly looted in Elder's jewelries as soon mm-hmm. as they fled mm-hmm. after the people power. Is it that is that true now? And how can I tell you it's true? I stole. Yeah. Um no, when 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 I got to Malacanang on the fourth day, the safe was open. Okay. And I saw all tribal jewelry inside and then I spoke to a lady who was very close to Mrs. Marcos and she told me that Mrs. Marcos had put the jewelry in diapers and she had given it to Madame Kauki some of the jewelry upon landing in Honolulu mm-hmm. yeah. I, I met Mrs. Marcos two years ago and I spoke to her and I said Mrs. Marcos I don't have any for jewelry I said to her and she said I never said that you had it and I said well I was told that you did, but I want to clarify that I don't have it. And that whatever inventory I saw, I gave to Cory Aquino. Mm-hmm. And all that, all all the papers, because I'm a historian, I got all the papers that I could get, that I'll admit, and I brought them to the residence of Dr. Angelita Reyes, who was also with me in Malacanian. I brought with me, just to be safe, the... Um, the researcher of the National Archives. I brought with me the chief librarian of the National Archives. I brought with me the photographer of the National Library. And I brought another one who documented what I documented. And we put everything in two cars. I, uh, I think we were two cars. And none of them hit my house nor my in-laws house in 11 Palm Avenue. We brought them directly to Angelita Reyes's residence, who was with us, and we carried them up, not me, I couldn't carry those luggages up, into her attic. In the morning, when we had this meeting that we were supposed to check out what the papers were, I saw in her house in that Reyes village, President Ramos, um, Senator President Ponce Enrile, I saw Onasan, and I saw Jimmy Ongpin there. And Jimmy Ongpin called Pepin and said, and said, we have the papers that your wife took from Malacanang and we're going to bring them to the Central Bank. And they were papers that I know were agreements between political leaders and Mr. Marcos regarding uh, logging, which was one of those papers that I saw. Yeah. And they were taken to the Central Bank, yeah. together with any inventory that I had gotten. And that's the truth. I was. I didn't know that there was a hearing in New York where Angelita Reyes was invited. Angelita Reyes got into the picture because she asked Cory when Cory assigned me to go to Malacanang in Cahuanca building to go to see if everything was clear. That day I also saw Georgie Binay there. Yes, and I saw many military men who were there, Philippine Army. Yeah. And um we we sat on the floor and we just gathered all the papers that we could get and brought them to the central bank. But none of the I uh, none of the jewelry. There were some in a little red bag and I brought them to the house of Angel Teres and I never saw them again. You never saw them again? No. You never saw them again after you have seen and no. on the house of I the never earth. saw them again. It's yeah, in the book. I challenge yeah, it's her. It's in the book. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I I didn't buy the book to tell you the truth. Yeah. But but I challenge him because well, it's not proper for me to do that. I respect him as the Senate president. But he knows what papers they were. Still catching up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I um. You wrote somewhere that a uh, very uh, good meta- metaphor about your thinking ah, yeah. <laughs> that you will yeah. uh, make walis to the dirt of the the <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> is, um, is Actually, that that idea that yes. that is an intro to the walis thinking yes. and the rallies. It, mm-hmm. it didn't come from me. You How know? did it come? From no, it, it it didn't come. But I say, you know, that the daan matuit should also be malinis and tahimik. Uh, I added to that. Malini is Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I saw you sweeping. 
sleeping by you are giving yes. by sing thing. You see, because <laughs> like this, no? When Mikey was a little girl, mm -hmm. yeah. I trained my children to go to the rallies with me. But I wanted them to know what it was yeah. to fight for democracy. Mm -hmm. And Mikey was about seven or nine years old. And I China and my my and I told them, here's the Wallis thing thing. You've got to clean out the confetti that was thrown out ah. the window into Ayala Avenue. And so they cleaned. It was like a part of a little exercise and they were little kids. Mm -hmm. But I said, um, I love you, but I must instill discipline on you, and you must learn to love your country. And these are rallies, so you can come with me, but let's clean up after. And that's and and, and we got the clear dualistic thing. When I was the governor of Tarlac, there was so much lahar because of the eruption of Mount Pinatubo. It was a terrible time to be governor, but it was the most challenging time, especially for a woman to learn how to put the families together and assure them on a psychosocial aspect that there was someone who was going to help them um, materially and um, economically and also in the frame of mind that they should forget, you know, with the doctors and psychiatrists and psychologists that it is gone, their houses were gone, but that there was going to be new hope in new homes, in, in, new, sub in new subdivisions in lands, in Kappas, Protection, in Bamban, provinces of uh, municip uh, municipalities of Tarlac. And so we used the Wallis Ting Ting. And then I had remembered to use that because in my campaign, we I, I, I bought all the Wallis Ting Ting in Tarlac, mm -hmm. everything. I bought all the Wallis Ting Ting in Pangasinan. Mm -hmm. And we used that so that whenever I went to campaign, Little children were given each a Wallis Ting Ting to clean the schools, but as I passed by, they would wave the Wallis Ting Ting with the yellow ribbons. Yes. So that was my that was my campaign. Yeah, clean up, clean up. Yeah. And it, until now, it's uh, it you. Yes, I use it until now. Uh, okay. In fact, um, the other candidates always say to me that that um, I'm the only one who really helps the economy of the provinces because. When I get to a province, I buy all the Wallis Ting Ting that I can see, 200 pieces, 300 pieces, and then when they introduce my name, um, I, I, I give the Wallis Ting Ting away. I don't give out t-shirts that I throw, I hand the Wallis Ting Ting to them, and that's it, yeah, mm -hmm. so that they remember me. Mm -hmm. I like the metaphor. <laughs> yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. well, 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 okay, yeah. so she has something to say. Okay. Ah, okay. <laughs> but you know, I, I, I'll tell you so, something funny. It's like, the what is thinking in Holo is only 8 pesos, and there's only one more person that makes that what is thinking, and no more. So I ordered 200 from him in Holo. The what is thinking in Baju costs, um, 30 pesos, it's so expensive. Yeah. So I paid 28. Mm -hmm. The one is thinking in Iloilo costs 35 yeah. pesos each. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's so expensive. The the what is thinking in um in an uh, in um I think it was in Laguna cost eighteen. So ask me how much is the Wallis Ting Ting and I'll tell you how much it is all over the Philippines. <laughs> <laughs> you can have a map already. Yeah. A map so of the Ting Ting. That's why they always laugh and they say she's the only one helping the local economy. Oh. And I'm the only senatorial candidate who can say that I was shot at in España Retonda, tear gas, yes, tear gas forever, you know, and offered my life for democracy and freedom. And even if they think I'm old and I say that, it's the truth. No, you know one's ever told. <laughs> in España Retonda, <laughs> that was in España Retonda, that was in 1980, before the SL Revolution. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the army and the police shot at us, and the son of President Nemenso of UP, who was running with me, fell on the, on the pavement, and uh, while the soldiers were running and shooting at, at us, and we took them with these UP classmates and brought them into an apartment. But the saddest part was that every time we ran and tried to put him in, into any apartment, or even when we were running, because we must have been about 2,000 or 1,500, 
um, who were um, all seat parliamentarians, the Filipinos closed their windows and didn't let us in. And that I really felt so sad that suddenly it was a division of the Filipino people. Mm. So, so we got, um, well, here, there was just Mar I, I remember Maricor of, of UP, and she took on her bandages together with a friend of Memento. And then we took him when everything died down to, to the hospital. And of course, here in Makati, yeah, they water hosed us, and all the water came from the canal. Huh? All this dirty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that's okay. You know, I mean, I mean, it, it's a, it was a commitment. Yeah. It was more than that. I wanted my country <coughs> to be free. In fact, you know, I have to tell you this, which very few people really know. The day, um, I think it was before elections, I was in charge of ARNN. I went and I went um, to Tawitawi, Sulu, Samuanga, and Basilan, and I had my passport with me. The plan was that with this passport, I would I would end up in Tawitawi and find the boat to Saba. Cory with the thing was going to go from um, Cebu on a low flying flight over Pangasinan and Palawan and end up in Sabah. Then and Tess Oreta were already waiting for us in Malaysia. All of us were supposed to meet. The ambassador of the Malaysian embassy here had a seat for five of my children because every nationality sent their country's airplane to take their, their consular employees out of the Philippines. But the ambassador of Malaysia was so kind to me, and, uh, and we had five seats. But he said to me, Ting Ting, no yaya, just your five little children. And they had five on the Malaysian airline. And because Corey won, none of us ended up in, in, in Malaysia, but we were all ready to go to Malaysia and meet up there. Why? Because today, the Agong, of Malaysia, who is the Sultan, was the house guest of Ninoy because Ninoy was teaching at Boston University and the, and the Sultan, and he was then the Prince of Johor, would be with Ninoy and stay with him and their Boston residents. And so knowing him, uh, we established contact with him if Malaysia would take us in and keep us there at the same time if our revolution was not to pursue to success. Could you say something? I have a question. Yeah, okay. We have a question from Carlos Seldon. Uh, oh, Carlos. Hi, yeah. Carlos. How are you? Yeah. You're so funny. <laughs> I yeah. know. Yeah. Uh, Carlos asked if what uh, about um, your um, opinion about the 60-40 ownership. Oh, yeah, ownership in the Constitution. Would you support charter change and change the particular provision? I, I, I support charter change. I think, I, I think mainly, Carlos, well, let, 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 let me... Um, tell you this. I think the term of a local official is too short as three years. One year you're learning how to run it, and the other year you're running it, and the next year you're running for election. I think that should not be. Uh, four years is a good number to serve the country in a local government capacity. On the 60-40, I also sometimes wonder, because you know, um, if foreign nationalities were allowed to own more, a bit more than 60%, perhaps they would buy into more corporations in the Philippines. But that's something that the Constitution should be really changed and it should be um, dissected on how many really want to own um, more property in order for the Philippines to develop now, especially with so many jobless Filipinos. And I'm really thinking about that, that maybe they should, the foreign nationalities should earn a little bit, should have a bit more than 60%, a bit more, but they should be regulated according to what type of business will this be? I mean, I mean, sorry, 60% for the Filipinos and 30% for the foreigners, that maybe the 30% should be a little bit higher in order to encourage more foreign investment. Because the PPP 
has not even taken off. The PPP was 26 projects, you know, and it was meant to be like 2010, you know, 2012, 2013. And there's not even one that you can say is on a completion of the private-public partnership. I don't know why, you know, the government's going a little bit slow, and maybe the foreigners are saying if we own a little bit more of the corporations that we set up in the Philippines, maybe we'd be more enthusiastic in setting up more business. But uh, will that not mm, take the land? Uh, will the landless Filipinos not be protected with this kind of law? If there's an increase in the foreign ownership, landless? Yeah, there are some Filipinos who are landless. Well, you know, we're not meant to be lazy. We're not indolent, as some of the as results writing is. If you want to succeed, you've got to work. You know, it's not an excuse. You know, to say that that nothing can be done because you're landless. Many people are not landless, but many people are successful, you know? It depends on how much heart you put into what you really want, not just investment, but how much you want to succeed. It's like my, my well, no, 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 my father's not a good example, you see, own land. But, <laughs> but there are many that don't own land, but are successful. That, that was the answer. That was the stand of another candidate. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, that yeah. didn't really like the increase because of the land of Philippines. No. Uh -huh. Yeah. I, I, I think it really is the capability of how much you really want to succeed. Mm -hmm. And in so doing, get rich and your country richer. Yeah. You know, that question brings me up to the land reform. You know, the yeah, thing was, was part of the uh, land reform. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, the thing was part of the land reform law that, that President Macapagal in 1967, I think it was, yeah, there was a law passed. And the thing asked the old President Macapagal, why do you want me? You know, I'm such a big landowner. <laughs> if there was another landowner with me. Yeah. You know, there were two landowners, and just precisely that's why I'm asking you to join. And the thing said, has land reform really alleviated the plight of the people? No, not at all. Because they just gave the land. That's not land. That's that's giving the land, but it's not comprehensive agrarian reform. You just don't leave the Filipino up to do what he wants with the land. You've got to help him develop his own capability to earn a living from the land and adequately give him seeds and fertilizer and water and marketing. We've got to teach them where to plant, when and how if we want to intercropping. And we have to really help them in the marketing. You know, in Tarlac, when I was the governor, I said, okay, policy, 18 municipalities, one product, one municipality. Because they were selling so much watermelon in the highway, and some of the watermelon was 30 pesos, some was 25, 15, they were killing each other. No. So I said, but if, if Paniki um, grows peanuts, and then um, watermelon in Capas, think a mask in Paniki, you know, then all of that, then you put it in the streets. So I did better than that. I gave them a baksakan because this is the part, the time of the lahar. They had nowhere to put their products. Their lap was flooded with dust, mud, water, felled trees. So I said, let's build 18 of them. And, and, the, and the president gave me 18 productivity centers. Wow, three times the size of my house, huge. And that's where they put until today. They hold their meetings there. They hold the, their crowning, crowning the queen. They put all the rice there, the palai, anything they want. It still is there. Yeah. And that baksakan where anybody can go and buy. Yeah. At least that's my legacy. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious. Um, after you uh, finish your term as governor, how come it took you a long time to run the public office? Well, I went to school. I went to school. Yeah. And is it yeah. the defense? Huh? No. I went to school. I finished my PhD in mm -hmm. Philippine history and criminology. And it was at that point in time when I was through studying that I received a call from President Gloria Arroyo. Mm -hmm. And she said to me, would you like to be my asset? She said, I have to build 1,680 school buildings, but only in remote and hazardous barangay. And I said, she does my type. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Remote so and able to do that? I did. We did it with the Philippine Army in the Chinese Chamber. Yeah. We did. We finished. Um, 
with the DPWH, with the DILG, uh, with the uh, the Muslims, with the uh, with the Igorots, with the um, in Caraga, uh, we did we did one six eighty. It was even much cheaper than giving it completely to the DPWH team. Mm -hmm. The Army Engineering Brigade. Mm -hmm. It was made in conjunction with the streets, with the roads. Yeah. You know, like in Bolton and Barira, Maguindanao, there were no roads, but there we were, you know. And we even had to ride a horse going down just to be able to construct the schools. You remember, the order was remote and hazardous were guys. We, even with the NPAs, we did. We just crossed through. We weren't afraid. Especially in summer. Yeah, we took a boat to build the school buildings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when I, that was done, I think I spent about two and a half years doing <coughs> that, or two years. Mm -hmm. Then I got a phone call from the secretary of GILG, Lucas Jolina, and he said, uh, Gloria wants to make you um, the I, I, I undersecretary for moral concerns. And I said, yeah, sure. Yeah. So I did that, and then later I got a call from her and said, I want you to be the president of the Philippine Public Safety College. And I said, what's that? And you know, just a school for police, fire, and chief personnel. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it was so badly run. And uh, I had to make it a respectable school. So I called, um, I, I, I called Krame, and I said, I'm now the president of the school and I'm closing it down. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> so I called civil service, uh, Karina David, and I said, Karina, I'm closing it down. And she laughed and laughed, and she was really laughing. And she said, okay. I said, I'm going to ask for a moratorium to this school, because it, it, it needs like a total um, program of instructions that is completely new. Mm -hmm. You know, the students must be given high morale. Um, the student, the, the teachers must be removed or suspended mm -hmm. and for those that sell grades and exam questions. And so it is what it is today. It's, it's, it's gone up a lot high, sky high. Mm -hmm. So yeah. what made you want to get for the Senate as a candidate? Well, when I was asked to run, it was by, uh, by Jojo. Jo uh, Jojo Bina and Bebing got together. Oh, and, okay. and, and um, they decided that if they had to go one in the slate, it would be good to show that we were not fighting no noise. Mm -hmm. yeah. That um, um, I was there because, mm, well, all of us are there because we believe that we can have a, a, a Senate that can be different, different faces, different people, you know, and just nine candidates. We all have a program of government that we work out together. Yeah. And, uh, and with my qualifications from my work in local government, that's 11 years, the, uh, the ILG plus six as governor, mm -hmm. and my studies, you know, I'm the only one that has two PhDs and, and two, two master of degrees, mm -hmm. and, and my studies in public safety that's taken me eight years to study in public safety. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, now that um, you're in, uh, um, what's it called, this? Um, public safety, that is your main platform, so what do you think about um, total gun ban. What? Total gun ban. Should yeah. you have a total no, gun ban? No, no. I'm yeah. going to be very frank about this. We don't, we, we mustn't have a total gun ban because the criminals are not going to give in their guns. And so the criminals are, will be the ones to have a gun, guns. And how about those law abiding citizens who don't have protection from criminals? I, what I would advocate would be neuro, a neuro exam for anyone who holds the guns. Yeah. I advocate that any gun that's sold or not sold should be reported to them, to the police, because they're the ones that are in authority to, to issue the guns. And um, anybody who sells and buys should automatically, you know, go to the PNP and report it as being theirs, or it could be illegal possession of firearms. There should even be a school, and there are actually, you know, gun clubs that teach anybody who owns a gun how to handle it properly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How frequent do you go to Tarlac? Um, I go to Tarlac, I stay in Luisica. Yeah. I go there mainly because people die. 
deaths and baptisms and weddings. Mm -hmm. And I go there when anybody needs me. But we usually have our meetings in the Tiananmen Meeting. Mm -hmm. This is time. You're from Pampanga, right? Ah, yes. I'm based oh, in yeah? Pampanga, but I'm actually going everywhere. I'm That's really good. more into agriculture. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Because I'm a veterinarian. Ah. We used to have a lot of vets coming to us at the thing in my cat or was it in the Visita? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, equine practitioners. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, my, I'm more involved with the swine industry. Oh, my daughter has an organic farm for pigs. Yes. Organic. My gosh, she's so, she's so, uh, <laughs> you know, we, we can't even go there in a car. We have to wash our shoes, you know. Yeah. So strict. Yeah, so strict. But mm -hmm. she has little pigs that are, that are like this small. You know, when I was governor, I used to have fresh milk every day. She had 150 cows. And then she imported the cows from Australia and they were sick. And the DA sold it to her, Ooh. and they and, and 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 they came and brought in a disease, and all her mm -hmm. one hundred and fifty cows are wiped out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, I think there was one instance that uh, there was a disease coming yeah. from Australia. That was terrible. Mm -hmm. But we had a cow living with us because we because we had a we had a cow with a baby, and um we had to help her give birth. So we nagay namin sa labadahan, you know so. She had her baby there, and she was too weak to feed her baby, so we had to give chup chup. Yeah, mm -hmm. so we fed that cow. That cow stayed with us until the cow got, got this big, you know. And we really love that cow. That you know, I really believe that you can domesticate any any animal as long as you treat that animal well and feed him well. You know, that cow. The cow's name was Cow Hanko. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We named him. Really? Yeah. Nickname cow, cow. Yeah, we had the first name for that cow. Ah, okay. And we'd say, come here, come here. And he'd come to us. And then, you know, uh, amazing, you know, brilliant cow. And then he used to climb the stairs and then go to my sala, oh. go up the bedroom. How big the cow? Big. Yeah, because it began like a little cow, like like, mm -hmm. like, like this small. Mm -hmm. that, and then oh. he got bigger and bigger. He jumped oh into the pool. Gosh. You know, you can domesticate wow. a, a cow, amazing. Yeah. Never seen a pet. Yeah. But you know, yeah. But you know, what happened was that he started getting taller, so he would eat my blouses. I had I had one blouse. Oh, no. You know, I, I had like 10 or 8 blouses of one kind. This was my uniform as governor and khaki pants. Ah. He started eating my, my, my blouses, and I said, oh. hey, no, we can't keep this cow. <laughs> because he was getting already a little bit too big. Yes, and then he would go to the jeeps that we had huh? because we used to go by jeeps, you yes, know, they those, can eat those U.S. jeeps that you buy mm. in Capas, you know? Yeah. He'd eat the leather upholstery, he'd everything, you know, and he, he could put his mouth, you know, okay. and shoes. So he said, it's a bit hard to have Gauhanko here, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Gauhanko. <laughs> so we put him in a big, big pen with his mother. Um, I know you mentioned that um, you joined Una, um, Una because um, I guess Una wanted to show that they're not trying to fight this human. But I, I guess it's uh, at Takofango, it's really weird that they're not part of um, community, considering oh. that you also worked as a presidential assistant to Cory in No, I never worked for Cory, but I caused the first piece peace agreement with MILF during Cory's time, that was 1987, because I knew the MILF. So we met in a Sinoy crossing in Maguindanao, and we signed the first peace agreement. I brought the ping with me, myself, and the MI brought their ustaches there, and it was then the Primitalis DILG who signed it in 1987, the first peace agreement. Yeah. Okay. But me as a Kowanko, I never worked for Cory. I only worked for Cory as back channeling for the MILF. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. I, I, I've never worked under Noi Noi, but um, I have enough expertise to be able to work for him, but 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 no one will tap me in Malacanang because that's exclusively I their know. clique, okay? Yeah. yeah. Um, so um, the, the, the question was, why am I Una? Okay. In 1978, Ninoy was running against Mrs. Imelda Marcos in Manila. 
he formed a team of 18 I think it was not 24 18 candidates from his side and the, and 18 from Miss Martha's side um, Senator Salonga Senator Jerry Rojas boycotted that election and they did not want to support Ninoy and Ninoy was then a member of the Liberal Party so Ninoy asked the permission of Johnny Potts and Rile to ask the thing to visit him because they needed he needed a political party to carry him and Laban was established. Laban's organizers were um, Andy Roses, um, Mochi Mitra, Georgia Binay. Um, we had Jokdo's advisor, Tanyada. They were all part of that. Or Neptali Gonzalez. Yeah. And we formed Laban in order to be able to fight that election of 1917. So um, eventually PDP joined up with Laban and in 1992, 95, 98, I ran as PDP Laban in Tarlac. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I like PDP Laban. It's a bottoms up party. The bottom is the barangay and whatever they decide go, goes up to the National Council. The National Council doesn't make any decisions without consultation. And the smallest political unit, the barangay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Mm. We have a question from online. Um, what is your stand on the mining law? Responsible mining. You're for responsible mining. Yes. What is that? Because um, for me personally, I don't believe in mining and fragile ecosystems like you know, this island. Where it will affect the well, sea and the no, that's why you have the DNR to monitor that. And if the DNR is monitoring it properly, you're not going to dig under the Dinagat Island, you know, and it's going to fall um, into the sea. Mm -hmm. That's their responsibility. That's why there are departments that should oversee mining. Yeah. But I really believe that, you know, there are a lot of foreigners who want to come in here for mining. And, um, and I really encourage it because God gave us the mine, you know or coal, gold, you know, in order to be able to rip from these blessings. I really believe that in my heart, you know. It, it, it's there. It's going to help our economy make money so that, you know, they're not pipi chugin. These people that come here put in billions, you know. That's what I'm saying. Like, if you go midstream mm -hmm. and then into a policy and change the policy, then these miners are accountable to their investors. You know, we don't change the policies midstream. And there's no harmonization of the mining law between the local government and the and the uh, department of DNR regarding the mines. Mm -hmm. You know, there should be harmonization because I know that the <coughs> governor can give permits, but then but then now the Lima is saying no, they shouldn't, and this you know other other factors. That's why people are turned off from wanting to come and be investors. But you know. When we have a big mining firm coming here and they know exactly what should be done according to the terrain and they're responsible that they don't dynamite and, and you know, there's every precaution imaginable, you know, and and they certainly wouldn't destroy the, the billions that they put into the Philippine mining industry, you know, to be irresponsible and have their contracts cancelled. Oh yeah, because it will take hundreds of years to build it back. It's can't once you excavate everything there. So no, but, but precisely, that's part of mining. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we'll have no more islands left. <laughs> that's no, idea. that's responsible mining. You're, mm -hmm. not, you're not going to saturate equipment with back posts just to dig and to dig and then reach the sea. No, no, man. Mm -hmm. You cannot do that because you'll have uh, measurements on how deep into the sea you can go, you know, or, or how wide is the land that you can occupy. That's all the permits of the DNR. That's just their responsibility. Mm -hmm. so yeah. Because you're composed of islands. No, but that thing doesn't mean to say that an island is only like a hundred meters down and when you start digging into the sea, you hit the, the sea level. No. no. I think the DNR would really know what to do in terms of per if permit, yeah. you know, a public-private partnerships that have to do with mining. Uh, log ban. Are you for log ban? The log ban? Yeah. Yeah, I'm for it. Until until loggers, you know, uh, cut trees irresponsibly and don't 
plant new trees, there has to be a lot of land. How is it in Mindanao? In well, your visit it's there. not only Mindanao, it's other areas of the Philippines that's barren, you know, mm -hmm. for, because so many take advantage, even Quezon is barren. Mm -hmm. It's not only Mindanao, you know. Well, well yeah. all the latest reports also were coming from there. Mm -hmm. Big truckloads. No, I've seen them right here in Cavite. Yes. Big truckloads, yeah, mm -hmm. coming from Quezon. Yeah. Again, the DNR should be monitoring this. It's their responsibility. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, other questions? Are they coming online? Mom, do you have any proposed programs or uh, bills for to support small entrepreneurs? Okay. How to encourage entrepreneurship? I truthfully, I don't lie. No, not yet. No. Although there's a little school that I, w I wanted to, a trade school, mm -hmm. and we discussed it last week about having um, a little trade school as part of entrepreneurship and um, to teach only how to, how to cook, to, keep, uh, to teach wa waitering, mm -hmm. and to teach um, carpentry to those inclined to, to want to do carving, mm -hmm. and to teach music if they want, you know, yeah. That's that. Yeah, that's that. That's my little niche of entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. And then to go from province to province, teaching. Pero would you be supporting programs that would allow um, access to funds for small entrepreneurs or startup entrepreneurs? Because normally, ito yung common problem, and that's why they well, end up with a five six. But where can they borrow? Even the farmers now can't even borrow from any bank. The banks want money. They don't want land. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there must be some institution that's willing to lend them money to begin small scale entrepreneurship. Let's look into that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What are what reforms can you introduce in the uh, military? Especially we have the current issues of cable costs. By you know, uh, force disappearances. So, do you have something on mind? Yeah, I have something rather strong in my mind. Why is it that the NPA is never charged with human rights offenses and the NPA can charge the army with human rights offenses? Why is that so? How come, you know, the, the you know, this is completely demoralizing for the army? And for me, as a, even a lieutenant, uh, as a full colonel, you know, it's demoralizing that, that if I try to keep the peace, you know, and then anyone can file a case against me for human rights abuse. It's the same with the police. Mm -hmm. How can you do your duties when, when immediately you're charged with offenses and then you're relieved of your position mm -hmm. without even proving guilty or not? No, I'm very strong on that. It, it really angers me why it's so lopsided. And you know, Schooling and training, you know, these gentlemen, you know, and ladies that belong to the armed forces of the Philippines or the or the jail fire and and the police organizations, they're not stupid, you know, they're very intelligent. They're lawyers, they're engineers, they're criminologists, they're nurses, they're doctors, you know. Just because the uniform personnel doesn't make them less intelligent than you and I. <laughs> no, not at all. So they know that when they they embark on any operations, it's a risk that they take to fulfill a duty. And yet, they're charged with human rights offenses. Look, you know, already the psyche of the public is X person was salvaged and this person was buried here and this person was killed. But this is even proven. And already the judgment is there. It's really quite unfair. And if they're not there, who's going to keep um, peace and order? Um, I'm going to name some of the um, issues that we have in the country. Can you make, I guess, a quick one to two sentences about it? Okay, um, are you children? I'm, uh, I'm a mother of five children, and I've never had an abortion. <laughs> <laughs> so. I don't believe in the RH bill. Okay, the boys. 
divorced, no. Because if we had divorced, it would mean to say that it would be so easy to get into marriage. Why is it that we need to divorce? Just because America has divorced or other European countries? No. I think we should keep by Filipino value, no divorce for me. I then agree. anybody can get married and say, I'll get married and I can file for divorce <laughs> when I'm tired of my marriage. No, marriage is a commitment before God. Yeah. Okay. Cybercrime. The cybercrime law, yes, um, there are, I, I believe that, that cybercrime should be punished, extremely yeah. punished. Okay. That's why, freedom of information. Yes, everything, everything should be um, known by the public. Uh, transparency, accountability. And uh, mm -hmm. except on national security issues. Same sex marriage? No. Um, marriage is made for procreation. I don't believe that there should be same sex marriage, but as we all know, it is a personal commitment of anybody that's either a woman and a man who want to live together. And it's done anyway, so why do you need a marriage? Death penalty. Yes the death penalty should come back, should be returned, to really make people afraid that there is, you know, that there is justice and you can't take anybody's life, you know, because if, you know, if you don't have the death penalty, it should serve as an example, you know, for others to, to be afraid that it is a sin to take other, another person's life. Mm -hmm. uh, Something light, no man. <laughs> for women like okay. for women like uh, over fifty, yeah. <laughs> like me. <laughs> How do you? Uh, well, for you, what is beauty? I mean, taking care of yourself. Because like uh, I hate the answer that says beauty yeah. is within. No, beauty no. is an attitude. No, I mean yeah. about taking no, care of yourself. That's why yeah. I'm not going to answer that. Yeah, not that yeah. kind. Of <laughs> I mean, in tips, ma, like uh, for you, uh, of yeah. uh, Making yourself feel beautiful or or just care being yourself. beautiful, right? Yes. Yeah. Do you have any secrets that you can share? Vitamin C on my face. Ah, vitamin yes. C. Yes. Yeah. Non-oily vitamin C, but but liquid. Okay. Yeah. Um. I I, I buy this cream. It's called Neostrata, uh, hyaluric acid. It's extremely good for the face. Yeah, it closes the pores. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. I'll buy that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You should actually. Hyaluric acid. Yeah, uh, hyaluric acid. Hyaluric, yeah. Um, vitamin C. Um, if you want to peel your skin a little bit, use vitamin A at night, and it gently peels it in about a week. You don't even realize that it's being peeled. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If you do it on a certain a percentage that's lower, mm -hmm. huh, don't use it strong because your skin has to get used to it. Yeah. And I, I use sisley cream, it's really good. Was it? Sisley. Oh, sisley. When my skin is really very dry, I use that sisley cream. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so it's very simple regimen. I use ivory soap, I don't use any cleanser, just soap and water. Ivory. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Soap and and then at night I put my retin A. Oh. Yeah. And then uh, in the morning I put my vitamin C and my hy hyaluric acid. And when I feel that my skin is really dry at night, I put my sisley cream as a moisturizer. Uh, none of those expensive anti-aging creams? No, I, I get allergies. Oh, you do? Yeah, because I think there's a little bit too much of it. Of, I can't figure out what ingredient it is. Yeah. How do you I mean, how do you take care of yourself during the campaign? Like, you know, all oh, that, I mean... Sunscreen? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh. I mean, what time you sleep, uh, sleeping on? You know, I never sleep. Huh? I hardly sleep. I, I mean, I have like four to five hours sleep. Is it okay? I it's mean, okay for me. I think I've, I've gotten used to it because the only free time for me to study is like 4.30 in the morning until 8. Yeah. In the morning. Until 8 a.m. and then it's time for school. Mm. You know, my, my, my system has been used to that yeah. so for many, right. many, many years. So you could you live with five hours of sleep? Yes. I thought you needed six or yeah. seven. Eight actually. Yeah. yeah. No, I no, I but the I minimum actually was sleep at about one in the morning and I wake up at uh, sometimes five thirty. I mean more often five thirty than six. Oh yeah. Actually it's really funny because this house has been blessed so many times. 
Because when I wake up at 4.30 to study, huh. it's like I say, I see like little shadows you know, running around me, and I say, oh my gosh, what's going on here? You know, so many times I have holy water beside me, mm. and salt, and I sprinkle, and I say, you're not going to scare me, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> So, what do you do to keep your mind sharp? Just keep reading. I read. I read a lot. The mind really has to be sharp because my father had Alzheimer's, and I'm so scared. Okay. You know that if I don't keep my 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 mind busy, I don't want to be sick like that. You want to learn something new, right? Um, Every day I try to learn something new. Today I've learned something new, and you've taught me more about the importance of being a blogger. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. I, was, uh, Sorry, I, I was thinking, I was just going to ask that, don't you want to try tweeting or just even showing photos like Instagram? Mm -hmm. uh, because those are interesting to like taking pictures. Yeah, that's why, uh, huh? you know, that's why when Lira said, you know, that I would meet you, but you're the second match of bloggers yes. that I meet. <laughs> you know, then I was thinking, you know, this is how Obama won elections, right? And he got donations through, through, uh, an account, no? Yeah, but we're still far off from that. <laughs> yeah, but why not try to go that way? Because, you know, we were going to raise funds to free the 36 Saba um, okay. refugees that are now detained. Uh -huh. And I had the jail, because the jail makes my my little souvenirs of what is thing. Mm -hmm. The women in jail, because they have nothing to do. So, I, I'll, I'll show you a sample yeah, of my little what is thing. Oh, uh, for 5,000, yes, they make it for me. Uh, for one thousand molesting thing, um, they charge me five thousand pesos because they have nothing to do. And we were going to sell that outside the churches, and you, and you could imagine a Muslim selling the molesting thing outside the Catholic church mm -hmm. in the grounds. And you can contribute between uh, five hundred pesos to to one thousand, or or five pesos to one hundred pesos, and. This was going to help the refugees also for them to be able to send their kids to school. So I'll show you the whole thing. Yeah. But but um I, I, I've been into this for the past um four months. The women in the Chapo jail make my whole thing, thing, my miniature ones that I give out during the campaign. Mm -hmm. And then they um, I, I sent an officer to buy the components and then we tie it like really tightly against them the wallis thing thing and then with a the little round um, metal for the key holder. Do you have any last questions before we wrap up? That's why I was so strong about those women that stay in jail longer than what their term is for punishment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, we can just uh, finish up. Thank you, Anna. For you know, uh, yeah. Thank you for the suggestions. Really, the suggestions, especially that that, that entrepreneurship. Because yeah. if I did it, I would have to say what I have. But if somebody else had that idea, it certainly would take you a little bit long. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes we help, but we have what we can. But you know, we also budget. You know, for what we have. And I'd like to take a look at that. Yeah. It's, it's a very good suggestion. Yeah. yeah. That's that book that feels funny. Yeah. So that we are an employee generating nation. Yeah. Oh, no, yeah. So if we could train the young people uh, mm -hmm. before they graduate and they say, I want to start my own business yeah. rather than I want to be employed in this company. And that company. Yes, because that really happens to us. Because even my nephews, you know, you know, they're all employed, and I say, well, we start this, but then, you know, they all start get discouraged there. Mm -hmm. And mainly they're scared of of, of accounting, mm -hmm. you know, on how they can get it back. The risk? Yeah, Taking the risk, risk is one of the first thing yeah. when you're an entrepreneur. That's the fun part of it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell them. Mm -hmm. What's the one thing? Uh, there is in the hallway.